And the story, roughly speaking, is, what is it? It's that we already have apocalypse on, our, on its way, and it really will be apocalypse. Be very, very frightened. Politicians and leaders are doing nothing about it, and nor are they ever going to do anything about it. So even though it's unfair, because the elites are going to keep on benefiting from it, you have to take responsibility. And the way you take responsibility is by giving up, giving up, giving up, leave your car at home, don't fly, the whole thing. Huddle at home in your sweater. Please spread this message. <laughs> Now, we have been spreading that message for a long time. You know what? I'm kind of tired of it because it clearly doesn't work. So here's my reformation. I think we're trapped in this old story and we need a new one. And I have a suggestion for what that new one should be. So, first of all, the first part of the video. Is it real? Is it true? Is there an apocalypse that's already here and is going to get worse? Now, this is the part that I certainly, as a scientist, I was talking about this a lot. Yes, it is. It really is. Climate change is real. Climate change really does come first for the poorest and for the people who've done least to cause it. And then, It comes for the rest of us. I'm not going to labor that. I'm not going to go through all the same message that was up there, but it is real. There's nothing up there that I disagree with, and if you look at the projections, it would only get worse. There are uh, two parts of that story that I think we're missing that are actually very important. And one part is the sense of direct relevance, not just to poor people in, in other countries, but to all of us. And apparently, 60% of the US population think that climate change is going to affect the US at some point. But 60% also think it's not going to affect them. So there's a missing part of this story, which is how much does it affect me? And once, a couple of years ago, I did a workshop for a whole bunch of businesses in, in Manhattan. And I was thinking, how do I help them understand and feel this? And so I, I arranged for it to be held in the only hotel that stayed open during Superstorm Sandy. And they were a bit surprised. It's a slightly funky hotel in Lower Manhattan. They were kind of, what are we doing here? But when it came to the evening, I got the manager of the hotel to come and talk about what it was like to be there when their hotel was open and it was surrounded by a sea of darkness. And the reason their hotel was open was that they had a, a generator on the ground floor, not in the basement, so it wasn't flooded. And this young woman talked about what it was like to be in Manhattan. She said that they, one, one evening, she actually walked with a friend all the way up to 24th Street so that they could have a Coke and eat a burger and be back in America. And on one side of the street, you could see Manhattan and America, and the other side, you could see a science fiction movie. You could see Apocalypse. And when they were standing there in that hotel, they realized that actually this really happened now and it's going to happen again. And you could see the difference in the way that they were responding to this story. So that's just one thing, how it's directly relevant. This, this, uh, this danger is coming for us. And there's also another important point, which is equally frightening, in fact, probably more frightening for me, my, my nightmares, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the Greenland ice sheet, acidification of the oceans, and the permafrost in the Arctic. If any of those, the, the, the Greenland ice sheet has about seven meters of sea level worth of ice in it, if that starts melting seriously, then we're going to get a very significant increase in sea level. The West Antarctic ice sheet has something more like, like four meters. Um, the acidification of the ocean could make a very big difference to the, uh, to the food chain. And most particularly, the permafrost in, in, in um, uh, the north, in the Arctic. If you, if you turn your freezer off, the food inside, it starts to rot. And if you start to melt the freezer around the top of the world, the Arctic, it has loads of carbon packed in there, leaves and, and, and twigs and, and other kinds of carbon that are locked up in the soil. If you melt it, it starts to rot and give out methane and carbon dioxide. And if that methane and carbon dioxide comes out, it's the greenhouse gases that start to warm the place up, and so you get more melting and more warming. And in the end, you can get a runaway. And you could ask me, how much carbon is there down there so that we know what we're, we're facing? And the answer is, we have no idea. And you can ask me, well, when will it happen? What temperature can we get to that we know that it's not going to happen? And I can say, too, we have no idea. So I call these, <laughs> these are my four horsemen of the apocalypse, if you like, and it's actually very frightening. 
And I've already told you that the more I go out with this message, this is frightening, the more people close down, including me. This is not what's required. It's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Because there's actually something quite exciting in this. At the moment, we have the opportunity to make the choices that will decide which of these futures we're going to have. This apocalypse future or something else. I think of it sometimes like a, a points on a train track. You're coming along on the train, you get to the points, and you choose, do I go right, do I go left? And then you get the effect of that quite a lot down the line. You end up in London or Birmingham. And when you get to London, it's too late to say, well, actually, I wanted to go to Birmingham. You have to make the decision when the points help you choose. And we, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, are the generation that get to choose those points. Which way do we go? And I actually find that quite inspiring. I don't think there's ever been a time in human history when one generation can make such a difference to what comes after. And that's a different part of the story. So, so much for the apocalypse. What about politicians and leaders doing nothing? Well, uh, it's not true. It's not actually true, luckily. Um, Donald Trump... <laughs> OK, so <laughs> I, uh, I had a bad day on Wednesday. Uh, I thought, he's not going to do it, he's not going to do it. God, it looks like he is going to do it. And then on Thursday, he did it. And just before I went to bed on Thursday night, I saw the news, he's pulled the trigger, it's going to happen. And I went to bed feeling very miserable. And I woke up very early, 6 o'clock, I was thinking, I don't want to look at the news, I just can't bear another one of these things. But I made myself look at the news, and I read one article, and then I read another, and then I read another. And then, I, I, I promise you, I literally danced around the room. I literally danced around the room. Because finally, finally, we're at the place where we needed to be. We've needed to be for so long. What happened after his announcement? You know, the, the Financial Times, even before he made the announcement on Thursday, the Financial Times headline said, EU-China Climate Pact. That was the headline. And then there was a kind of sub-headline. Uh, Trump considering pulling out of the Paris Agreement, comma, risks international isolation. And you know what happened after he made his announcement? First of all, uh, uh, um, various CEOs, Elon Musk and the CEO of, of, of Disney, immediately said, right, we're pulling out of your councils. We don't agree with what you're doing. Uh, three, three states, the governors of three states, immediately put out a statement saying, we are the United States Climate Pact. And we're going to stick to the Paris Agreement anyway, and that's the states of New York, California, and Washington. Now, if you just put New York and California together, and if that was a country, that would be the world's fourth largest economy. By the time a few hours had passed, it wasn't just those three states, it was seven more had joined them. And then meanwhile, late, late, late on Thursday night, it turns out that 65 mayors had sent out a declaration saying, our cities are going to stick to this. But by the time I woke up and was reading it, it was 85. Do you know what it was this morning? It was 150. <laughs> I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Businesses. And by the way, the, the important part about the cities and the states is that that's where the change is going to happen. That's where, on the ground, in the cities, in the states. And that's where the change is already happening, regardless of what Trump does. Now, headwinds from him can hurt, but they might also even, dare I say it, help to galvanize, if we have the right story. So, businesses. I said about Disney and Tesla. Get this, the CEO of Goldman Sachs issued his first ever tweet. <laughs> and do you know what he said? He criticized Donald Trump for pulling out of Paris because it was good to reduce America's competitiveness. Goldman Sachs, OK? So, and, and there's, there's, if you look at the businesses, Unilever are doing lots of stuff on this, Marks and Spencers and their plan A, Apple, Microsoft, Google. There's a, there's a coalition called the We Mean Business Coalition that has hundreds of businesses saying, we are committed to fighting climate change. There's a host of them. And then religious leaders. You know what the Pope gave to Donald Trump when he went to visit him? Do you know what the gift was? You do know. It was his encyclical on climate change. <laughs> <laughs> military leaders, military generals already know that this is happening and this needs to be dealt with. That there's a security risk, that there's implications for migration and so on. So I, um, 
I really think that this story, that leaders are not doing this, is the wrong story. And it's a story that we've been trapped in and we need to get ourselves out of. Okay, third part of it. The it's not fair because the elite aren't doing it, so you have to give up driving, give up flying, give up eating meat, give up being warm, give up lights, huddle inside your sweaters and cry. I, I paraphrase, but you know, we have sort of been giving this message, what can I do as an individual? Let's give things up. Now, um, it has been said, in fact, it's been being said in the environmental movement for, for more than a decade now, but this message still doesn't quite seem to have got through. Um, not Martin Luther, but Martin Luther King gave a very famous speech in which he did not say, I have a nightmare. He said, I have a dream. I have something to reach for. And he did talk about the nightmare in the same way that we need to. This is, this is one part of the future that we can choose, and it's a bad one. But he also painted a picture of a dream. And that's what gave that speech and, and its aftermath so much power. So, this is the part that I think has been hugely missing. This is my reformation, if you like. What are we trying to reach for?